Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Moss. I am the co-director of this year's HOPES 22 conference. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Sean Lallies, who is the founder of the Chicago-based firm Weathers, um, which has explored the creation of new spaces uh, and how those spaces uh, enable and shape the interactions of the people who use them. His book, The Air, Between Our, uh, the Air From Our Other Planets, A Brief History of Architecture to Come, uh, was the inspiration for this year's Criticism Journal theme, which you will see after this lecture. Um, and it fundamentally uh, rethinks the relationship between energy and architecture, challenging the perception of the line that separates architecture and the environment. Uh, please welcome me in uh, introducing Shauna Lee to Hopes and the University of Oregon. Hi, uh, thanks a lot for having me. Um, sorry we couldn't make this happen in person, but I'm glad we found some way of doing this. Uh, um, so, um, so thanks. <laughs> thanks for quasi having me there right now. Um, yeah, so the, um, the, the title of the, of the talk is called Let's Touch, and uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a, in a few more, in a, in a bit. Um, but just to kind of give you <clears throat> a little overview of what we're looking at here, I, I think you can see my mouse, right? Yeah. Okay. So on the, uh, on the left-hand side here where you're looking at, is a satellite image uh, uh, from NASA of um, the Midwest, so uh, Chicago uh, being right about here. Um, and on the right-hand side is you're looking at um, a zoomable contact lens from um, the EPFL, um, the university in, uh, outside Lausanne in Switzerland. And so on, on two sides here, on the left-hand side, you have essentially um, an image of the augmentation of, of, of the environment around us on Earth, right? So you're walking through a city, you're walking through a park. Uh, we were aware of light, uh, we're aware of, of, of street lighting, uh, who are probably not so much aware of, of, we talk about light pollution, but just as lighting itself, like being able to understand to just what extent we control the microclimates in the environment around us, either at the scale of, say, a streetlight or the idea of entire cities that um, are connected in these kind of web formations. So on, the one, on one end, you have this idea of, of how we manipulate the environment, um, not always consciously, um, or at least in the front end. And on the right-hand side here with the, with the zoomable contact lens, is something on the other side where we're looking at the human body and realizing that if on the left is, is visible light, meaning a kind of spectrum of light that the human body can perceive, and on the right is an augmentation of the human body, then you start to realize that both the environment of what we manipulate is open for debate and the human body itself and how we sense that space is also open for, uh, for conversation. So if you continue this going forward, you realize that the two of the greatest pressures on society today include humanity's manipulation of the environment uh, and the advancements of bioengineering of the human body. The first one of those is changing the, the actual makeup of the physical spaces we occupy, and the second is the very body that perceives that space. So outside of architecture, um, you have these two immense pressures that are directly tied to architecture. One, which is related to energy and climate, climate manipulation, climate change, um, which is a billion dollar industry. And you have um, bioengineering or even wearable technology, everything from Fitbits to glasses to much more advanced uh, examples, which I'll show in a minute. And at the intersection, what's really exciting here is that the intersection is for the is essentially architecture. It's the idea that if you can, at the intersection are physical boundaries that define architectural space. The focus is to integrate these two quickly advancing industries as the epicenter of architecture, spatial, social, environmental, and ethical discourse. So there's a lot of ways you could break down how you define architecture, and, and people can do it in a lot of different ways. Um, and so mine is a personal interest, but, but also not, um, not particularly subjective uh, in the sense that you could say what architects do is we create physical, physical boundaries, right? We use materials to create a physical boundary, and that physical boundary that has aesthetics, it has organizational implications, spatial implications, it, it, it informs how we interact with each other. And so if on one hand, we're at a kind of moment in time where we're aware of climate change. We're aware of all the kind of pressures that are asserting themselves now and how we think about energy. Um, 
And on the other hand is we have the human body, which is not, can no longer be seen and hasn't been seen for quite some time as, uh, as a given, given thing. It actually can be designed. It can actually be informed and changed. And so if you can manipulate a material and you can manipulate how the human body perceives that material, then that is an architecture. And that's really not a whole, that's not something that we as architects really think a whole lot about. Um, and so this is an example of, um, of an artist piece that, as you can tell, it's basically the dimensions of a, of a residential home. You can imagine that, you know, this is an entry foyer, um, living room, kitchen. Um, I think what's really funny about this is that there's actually nobody walking in any of the walls, so-called boundaries. So you have a kid here, you have someone on the outside, and someone who's actually going to be walking through um, one of these door passages. But essentially, these become the boundaries. And, and as architects, the most fundamental ways you can think about is architecture basically manipulates materials to create physical boundaries. And for... Um, for the most part, we don't think of energy as a physical boundary. We think of it as a fuel. We think of it as something that fills the, the kind of shapes and the geometries that we make of an architecture made out of concrete, steel, and glass. And so what's a kind of, this is an article that I had found a couple of, um, a year ago or so about, which was a really great study that looked at Google. Um, and this was an initiative that had been started called RE less than C, which is basically renewable energy less than carbon. And the, the approach, it was a, a short-lived program by Google, but um, what they were looking to do was actually try to figure out for the kind of brain trust there as a kind of initiative to see what they could do to actually make renewable energy um, compete with, um, with um, fossil fuels. Like, was, is it possible that we could actually start thinking about renewable energies in such a way, in such a measure, that it could compete with fossil fuels as a way of powering the world and what that would mean for climate change. And it had a really amazing moment where they actually broke the, the program down when they, when they kind of had the realization that even if they could get the technologies that were necessary to make um, and harness energy, you know, harness energy, whether it's through solar, whether it's through wind, whether it's through geopower, geo, what have you, um, that they could still not compete with, with um, carbon and a fossil fuel industry. Basically, they couldn't make it cheap enough. Um, and so what they wound up having is even if they ran those stats and we did switch over to this renewable energy, the CO2 um, uh, parts per million, you know, the idea essentially being that if we get to about 350 parts per million, that, that we're at a tipping point and that climate change is going to be underway and there's nothing we can much do about that. And at this point now, we're at something around 400. So we're well beyond the 350 parts per million of, of, of CO2 uh, in the atmosphere. And so what they realize is that once that happened, you're basically, it takes almost 100 years for that carbon to get trapped again. And so not only could they not find a way, running the math and running the, the numbers, to actually find a way in which renewable energy could actually outpace the carbon footprints that we're producing, they realized that you would actually have to start thinking about carbon sinks. Like, how could you actually take things like the ocean, plant matter, and other, other mechanisms as a way of actually removing and pulling carbon out of the, out of the, um, the air. And nonetheless, the, the basic um, realization was that this is sort of out of the hat, that this is, this is moving forward beyond what technology alone can, can change. And it was a kind of sobering moment. And the article was a really great article, and you should, you should check it out, because it's really a report by the people who, run, who ran RE, RE Less Than C, as just a way of reevaluating, going back on looking at some of their assumptions about what technology could do. And here on, on a kind of other side of this is that you have, say, uh, you probably, you know, maybe if you're like me, you, you watch the, um, the release of um, the Tesla car, the new the three model, um, you know, really kind of exciting, amazing to see uh, projections for, 24-hour sales for the release of that new Tesla affordable $35,000 car being projected at 30 to 50,000 sales, only to find out that within a week they have 350,000 pre-orders. Um, but it's also important to remember that even something like that number is really something like 1% of all auto sales. I mean, it's such a small number. But, you know, people like Elon Musk and the work that he's doing with SpaceX, Tesla, and uh, SolarCity, 
you know, one being the idea of the renewable of the, the energy for the car, for the electric car, uh, one being about harnessing energy uh, in terms of the solar panels, and the other being SpaceX, what we see here. And this is a kind of, this is an article, a little quote from him back in 2012 saying that the, the next important step in the evolution of life is that mankind develops a space-based civilization, ultimately becoming a multi-planet species. We would be backing up the biosphere, essentially. Humanity has obviously developed the means to destroy itself, so I think we need a planetary redundancy to protect against the unlikely possibility of natural or man-made Armageddon. And so when we think about Earth um, and, and the sort of evolving climate, the changing climate, um, just over 4 billion years of Earth's existence shows us that with, I think, you know, five mass extinctions, that there's nothing stable about Earth with us or without us. It's a constantly evolving um, place. And unfortunately, right now, we're playing a rather big hand in, in that evolution. But um, I, I'm, I'm kind of putting this out here with the, the SpaceX as, as, I think, one side of, of, the, of the bar graph, which is, you know, is the idea to actually start building this, you know, as he rephrases it, this uh, planetary redundancy or the kind of backup of, of Earth's biosphere somewhere else, knowing that it's going to be changing here? Or really, does it actually, is there an opportunity here to act for us as architects, us as designers, us as, as, um, as a species, to actually start thinking about what Earth will be like and the fact that it can no longer be seen as a kind of passive system that somehow um, needs to go back to an existing state, um, a kind of preservation or a conservation of what we've known. Because even, you know, tomorrow, Earth won't be the same as it was yesterday morning. It's a constantly moving thing. And so as we, you know, and so we're looking at here this idea of touching, which is if we look here on the left, you have this pink line. And, and there are uh, several, plenty of people who've talked about this, including um, Rainer Banham, who talks about and the architecture of the well-tempered environment. Um, if you look at this, this pink line, for the most part, I would say this is what people think of architecture. We, we think of architecture, we think of the organizational systems, the aesthetic systems, the spatial and the material as being an architecture as an act of mediating, meaning uh, we create a wall, we create a surface. That surface either lets things in through punctures and apertures like windows and doors, um, either it allows things to bounce back um, weather, like rain in the sun, or, you know, it, it, uh, it absorbs it, like a thermal lag, you know, being able to absorb that heat and then reading it back in. But for the most part, architecture is seen as this kind of mediating device. And the question is, can we start thinking about architecture as something more than just an act of mediation, but an act of amplification? Meaning, instead of seeing these white lines here as, as variables of, 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 uh, of our climate, like uh, electromagnetic or thermal, acoustic, um, light, uh, sound, olfactory, you know, that, that simply need to be mediated. And can we actually think about amplifying and honing those things as an actual material to build an architecture itself? The one thing I would say that's missing in the, in the image, though, would be the fact that the human body itself here in this image wouldn't be the same body we saw here. It would actually be a, a back and forth between the two. And so the negotiations required for the human body and the environment to touch imply a degree of impact on both of these, the body and the environment. Firstly, on one hand, the human body will be required to advance beyond being seen as an existing given variable, one in which uh, medical procedures and aids are developed not only for bringing individuals to an agreed upon average norm, but to actually extend those sensory, uh, sensory norms. Bioengineering, bioengineering and wearable technologies have shown that the human body's senses can be honed and augmented. This has been demonstrated in the evolution of visual aids from glasses to contact lenses to LASIK surgeries that can give the individual better vision uh, than the long evolution of our species was able to provide. This example continues not only through existing sensory perceptions, but could extend beyond our current abilities. Secondly, sustainability needs to be rebranded. The chemical, geologic, and biological components of the environment in which we build architecture are in a continual state of change. So that four billion years of historic of history has shown us that. And as discussions continue as to what constitutes a sustainable building, 
um, practices and what current ramifications of climate change will be, a common misconception exists that the answer entails stopping the clock on this four billion years of progression uh, in favor of perpetuating a single snapshot of our recent past. This is because conversations regarding what is best for the environment and the creatures living in it have directly tied together notions of a sustainable existence with the act of conserving the one we're currently in. Instead, it's likely that in order for humans to live environmentally responsible, um, the images we carry of a green environment, as well as the human body itself, might need to evolve. This will likely require not only a mutation of our values tied to the political and ethical responses of current and synthetic biology, climate modification, and environmental engineering already underway, but also a reevaluation of what actually architecture is. What this crisis ultimately produces is the opportunity for architecture to find new environments capable of being, quote unquote, responsibly lived in. Most importantly, touching, this idea of touching, shifts the role of architecture away from being seen as a third party entity, mediating the body and the environment, and instead places architecture at the root of a global discussion, actively designing the two parts themselves to be more actively tuned to one another. And so, this is not something we don't already do. Um, one of the, the, I think, a great example for me of, a, of an architecture that we see all the time that's made up just of energy is street lighting. And street lighting is essentially a form of energy, a form of spectrum of light that the human body has been evolved to perceive. It's not by chance that our eyes have tuned themselves to this spectrum of light between 400 and 700 nanometers, it's because that's the most amount of energy that more or less comes to and touches down on Earth from the sun. And so when we look at, at, at street lighting, it has all the hallmarks that, we, uh, that I was sort of laying out in the beginning of what an architecture is. It has a physical boundary. It has an interior. Um, it has a shape to it. It has an aesthetic. And it organizes um, activities. So if you're not in that light at a, night, at a, at a dark night, you don't have the safety associated with light. Within light, you can have recreation, you can have commerce. It's essentially revolutionized um, city planning and how we see cities. Um, and it has char characteristics that, are, that, that meet the definition of what an architectural shape is. And it's just like I mentioned before, it's not, you know, it's, it's not actually reproducing the sun. It's not giving us a reproduction of a known thing. It, it, is, it isn't actually the sun itself. It's a reproduction of just a very small bandwidth of light, of energy, that, that we can then perceive as an architectural shape. And if we think of these, these um, you know, as we shift to, from energy as being less, seeing it less as a fuel, seeing it less as something that, that fills the inside of buildings after we've already designed them to meet um, a, a kind of comfort level of what we perceive to be as you know, a certain level of relative humidity, a certain level of temperature that we find comfortable. Instead, our, this material, the idea of an energy, can actually, should, and has the opportunity for multiple reasons to actually be seen along the same lineage that we've thought of stone, concrete, glass, steel, iron. You know, these are things that didn't reproduce something that we already know. They actually gave us new shapes, new forms, and as they, as they kind of intersected with larger cultural pressures, they actually gave a, a kind of feedback that allowed us to see our spaces and our environment in new ways. And there are plenty of examples around today in terms of innovation, which is why I find this actually so exciting is because so much of this is happening outside of architecture so quickly. I mean, you don't have to, you just have to pick up an issue of Scientific American or Nature or, or what have you. And it seems like every month there's another um, kind of product that's moving out there that's talking about how, how these things are advancing. So whether it's here in Chicago, at least, we have um, these uh, heat lamps that we see within the, um, the streets or within, uh, more precisely, bus stops and, and train stations, which actually we think of as kind of heat lamps, but in truth, they're actually working in the far infrared light. They're actually working on a way in which you can, by working with far infrared light, it actually it affects the skin and actually works with the water molecules in your skin to actually allow you to kind of give off this, 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 this feeling of warmth as it vibrates those water molecules. Um, heat and the kind of light that we're giving off is a kind of byproduct of it. Um, if you look at something like sound, um, unfortunately or fortunately, you know, so much of this stuff actually comes out of the military, and that's, that's been the case since, um, what's a good example, um, the Eames, Eames bent plywood that they used for 
uh, splints. You know, that was originally a, a Department of Defense contract. I mean, there's a long history of that. And this is an example within sound in which you can use sound to actually focus it uh, much like a laser, where you can actually pinpoint a sound wave to the point where it can actually, these are primarily used out off on the back of boats. They're sometimes used in on cruise ships as a way of a, a kind of non-lethal way of deterring pirates. Um, but something like this, like the sound, is actually something that has made its way into um, product scale. So Herman Miller or Steelcase, these are companies that work with sound cannons in a much smaller pullback way that can actually, without creating... Uh, partitions in a room, they can actually create various sound zones so that if you had six or seven TVs or conversations going on in a, in a, in a business or in an office, uh, you could actually be located in different spaces without the walls and actually hear multiple conversations or be tuned to a TV that's 20 feet away in one direction while someone's in a conversation in another direction. So you don't actually need to create these wall partitions. You can actually just focus with, um, with the sound waves themselves. And, of course, energy storage, you know, everything. So this is a, um, an early uh, battery pack from Tesla um, and Panasonic looking at new ways in which they can harness and, and control energy. Um, and so, as I was mentioning, you know, so if we're looking on the left-hand corner here, this is um, a Richard Neutcher project. It's the idea of a kind of essentially a borrowed landscape where a glass, technically speaking, you know, the boundary, there's a thermal boundary here that probably exists right against the edge of that glass. But in terms of our eyes, we see it as a continuous open moment, quite literally having um, a pool come inside uh, the space. Um, so whether it's glass, whether it's concrete, or whether it's steel, each of these examples of when materials um, at that point, you know, obviously very expensive in the beginning dates, but you know, as time went on, you know, they, their, their prices dropped. And we didn't continue to, to develop these. We haven't been developing the primitive hut for thousands of years, except now doing it out of plastic when before we did it out of wood, right? We've sort of grown that. And it's become something else. It's taken on other characteristics, which are that the properties of the energy or the material allow for new possibilities, whether that be skyscrapers, whether that be um, large spans, whether that be transparency, whether that be malleability. And so the question is, when we start thinking about energy, is questioning what are some of the proclivities of energy if we start thinking of it as a building material to build spaces with um, that they could give us new, new, new potentials. And so what we're looking at here is just a little diagram of, of, of these material energies when they become a building, a building block. And so um, what, and they, obviously they have very different behaviors. So when we're thinking about steel, glass, concrete, what, what keeps those within the same central category is that they can be represented as surfaces, right? You can draw a line in your sketchbook right now you can go to Rhino, CAD, Maya, Illustrator, whatever you're working in, and we abstract a surface for eventually becoming um, a material. You know, depending on that thickness, you abstract it out. But you, you really are working with uh, surfaces, and that's how it's so ingrained in how we think about space. You know, we, we, don't, we don't think of it in much other way. But it, when you start thinking about energy and a material energy is that it behaves um, – completely different. I mean, it's, it's a gradient condition. You can't really draw an energy as a singular line. It's really a, a gradient a gradient space. And so here we're looking at acoustic, uh, chemical, thermodynamic, electromagnetic, so waves and particles. And they work on, on multiple levels. And I won't go into too much detail with that, but energy can be seen in, in multiple levels. So if, um, if on the top here we look at trophic, this is just the idea that energy actually can feed the human body, right? So energy is important to us. We know the importance of energy, the importance of being in the sun from vitamin D to the lack of that sun in, in cold winter months when people suffer from seasonal affective disorder. Um, the sun itself and energy itself is actually, you can think of it as a food. So when you talk about energy, um, you can think of it as a trophic or a kind of a, 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 an actual resource for the body. The, the next one kind of going in here is informational and um, these are not my terms. These are, these are terms from, um, from uh, environmental design, from, um, um, from how we think about um, ecosystems and how uh, environments work and function, um, and from physiology. And so when we think about informational, street lighting is basically an example of an energy that's informational. And it, what that means is that you can perceive that, that, that um, street light. You see it from a distance, you approach it, 
Um, you go inside it, you get light, you can read your book, you can feel that level of safety, you can play, you have soccer, do what you need to do. But it also is informational in the sense that it doesn't prohibit you from walking through it. You can ignore it. You could, if you go running, <laughs> you can also go running in a park at night and just run through each one of those street lights and it doesn't prevent your movement. It gives you a degree of information for access, activity, shape, and such, but it also allows you to disregard it. And then the most internal one is that idea of physical. And so that would be something like that sound cannon I showed you where energy in some form, you can think of it as a fire that's so hot the body physically can't access or go into it without suffering from it, or the idea of that sound cannon in which it actually causes physical harm. And so at that point, it actually becomes a physical entity that the body can't negotiate. It either accepts it or, or it doesn't. And so when we're thinking about that, that so that's, that's one side of component. I'm going to kind of tie these two together. So one, on one end is the physical body, is, is, are the materials. Like how do we actually tune the environment? What are those materials? How do they work? And how do we think about the environment not just as a series of surfaces and geometries, but actually as a series of microclimates and environments? The flip side of that is then the human body. Because as you'll notice that when we talk about things like acoustic, chemical, thermodynamic, electromagnetic, um, some of these could are very well outside of what the human body can perceive, right? So we don't see in the infrared, we don't see in the ultraviolet. Um, we only hear a certain amount of, of sound. We, we work from 20 to, 2, 000, to 20,000 hertz. Like that's, that's what our, our ears as humans are, are tuned to. And as you get older, you lose the ability to hear <laughs> some, of those, some of those ranges. They just they disappear. Um, and so some of them actually aren't within our kind of wheelhouse, you can say. But these are examples of augmenting the sensory perception. And, and these range quite a bit. And basically all these examples are probably within the last, well, except for Kevin, except for Kevin Warwick here, you know, these are all within maybe less than a year. So on one side, you have the kind of do-it-yourself, the people who are working to, to do things outside of labs. This is someone who that was looking at uh, chlorine E6. It's a type of uh, chlorophyll that has been done mostly in research animals, but um, I guess a few people have decided they're going to take it on their own. And um, if you put these drops in your eyes for about 25 minutes afterwards, you can actually start seeing the ultraviolet spectrum. And so these guys were actually going outside and actually for, the, for 20 minutes actually being able to see in the ultraviolet spectrum and in the environment around them before wearing off. Um, you have neuroenhancers. So these are um, propranolol or um, modafinil. Like these are these are drugs that are primarily used um, and developed for um, things outside of what their intended of what their recreational uses were for. So a lot of it is ADT and um, attention deficit syndrome and stuff like that. But they, they, Nature Magazine did a great study in the same way that you think about um, athletes using steroids to increase their body mass or their performance to compete at a higher level of athletic conditioning, um, I think that they, the, the Nature magazine, I forget this, the exact statistic, but it was something like one-third of scientists polled um, admitted to using um, essentially a neuroenhancer that would allow them to focus longer, study longer, stay up longer, and actually be able to, the same way you think about and how we, uh, 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 an athlete would enhance their body, that scientists the pressure within the, within the sciences is so strong that about one-third of them have used medication as a way of um, enhancing that. Um, new senses. Uh, so this is Kevin Warwick, um, kind of seen as one of the early cyborgs, who worked to, uh, just a kind of short version of this, he basically set up a sonar device on his uh, baseball cap in his office and connected that um, wirelessly to the computer which then um, was connected to um, a relay in his, uh, in his nervous system on his arm. And it actually, by being blindfolded for a period of time, he was actually able to pick up and develop the sense of uh, sonar, um, actually move around and engage within his environment. I mean, a lot of these studies where they're finding out with the brain and with our central nervous system is just how elastic that is. In a sense that that was a sense that the human body had never experienced before. But actually being able to, through a trial and error for, for roughly 20 minutes, he was actually able to understand the feedback he was getting within his arm and his central nervous system in terms of distance and, and direction, and actually use that and then tune it to, um, to his human body uh, as, a, as a sense that actually, unlike the other two examples, is something the human body had never had. Or in, in Korea, 
the, being worked on in the university, uh, Seoul National University, working for amputees um, within their arms, actually working with the synthetic skin that can actually feel uh, pressure. And so what's really kind of exciting within our generation being alive today is we're seeing a, a big transition now between for so long, we've, we've sort of seen um, human, whether it's through birth or whether it's been accident, a way of trying to bring the human body back to a kind of average, you know, bringing it back to seeing it as like a deficiency that then can be recreated and bringing it back to a so-called norm. So you get your eyes checked. You know, we all see 2020 as a kind of average, right? So if you don't have 2020 vision, you get glasses. Um, but of course, what we're finding out now is that if you get if you go to a doctor who's working on LASIK surgery, or whether it's um, sound in your ear getting a hearing aid, or, or any of these devices, is essentially we're reaching a tipping point where the doctor can do more than give you your kind of average sight or your average hearing. They can go well beyond that. And so you're starting to start this moment in which medicine is actually pulling back, meaning not, go, not going into the ultraviolet, into the infrared, giving you, giving you hearing that's kind of average within a, within a device or ocular implant. Um, and so the question is that that tipping point is a unique moment where for so long it was about kind of getting back to the norm, kind of agreed upon norm within, within social norms. Um, and really we're kind of going beyond that at this point. And so if we look at the human body, um, this is the idea of a kind of sensorial envelope in which on, the, on this drawing here on the human senses, we have everything from vision, um, to audio, to taste, olfactory, thermal receptors. Um, and you know, when people talk about how many senses we have, it's really a, a kind of tough thing to describe because we, we think about our five senses, but in truth, we have, we have many more. Um, on the right-hand side, we have artificial senses. So they're an, um, analogous to vision and taste and olfaction, but they probably would go beyond that. So the idea of the... Um, um, ultraviolet light as example and then there's artificial senses something that are probably seen in other species like the uh, the sonar and it's really amazing if to put these in perspective and realize okay sonar we know what it is we know bats have it we know we use it in the military we know we use it just to get around every day now with planes and such but 100 years ago probably when your grandparents you know with little tykes you know, we didn't know what sonar was. We, there were literally experiments 100 years ago of people basically duct taping or taping bats' eyes shut, trying to figure out how they fly. Like, this is not something we've always known. So within our grandparents' lifespan, we've gone from, you know, essentially not knowing what sonar is, not understanding um, the genome, sequencing the genome. I mean, there's been so many, so many changes of our understanding of the human body that it can't, it's, not, it's not crazy to look at examples like this and understand just how... People, whether you're doing it yourself, tinkering with what's going on, taking prescription drugs that are used for other methods, or actually experimenting with the human body and trying to understand how we can increase our sensory perception. And when we think about that, we go this idea of, on the left-hand side, this notions of a kind of arms race that's going on, where you could think of architecture for a long time being this duality of an increased knowledge of the human body, right? So everything from the Greeks looking at understanding, uh, I think it's pronounced antithesis, you know, this idea of of a weakened eye so that you would, you would kind of bulge out columns or, or um, bridge the middle of a, of, a, of a running long straight floor plate um, so that her eye wouldn't see it as actually as a weak moment and actually bend it the other way. Um, so whether it's from there to the circulatory system to optics to genetic sequencing, we continue to learn more about the human body. And then we found ways of using material control to then learn from that. So whether it's mediating for environmental controls or whether it's protection for exploration, going into space or going into the ocean, and we found ways of actually wrapping the body in new ways based on how we understand, or, or in the worst case, as analogies and metaphors, to understand how we know more about the body and then working with these uh, mediating devices to sort of understand the body better and protect it better. But if both the sensory perception, so what our human body is, meaning the sense that we could all could, we could actually tune our human sensory perception, and the advancements of material energies, the environment around us, is like neither one of those is really seen as a given now. Neither one of those is a priori, in the sense that you kind of have this back and forth now between both of those can inform the other. So you don't think of the environment as a given, and then the body can change, or the body can, can't change, and the environment can, and the materials. There's basically this back and forth, which 
is a rather unique period of time. And so when we think about giving shape to energy, it really is this relationship between if these darker purple lines are a gradient condition of energy, a material energy with gradient boundaries, you have a sensory envelope, meaning what the human body can perceive. And when those two come in contact with each other is basically how an architecture is, is formed, right? You perceive that change, you perceive that boundary, you can actually then engage it as an actual space. So again, going back to street lighting, if, you can, if, you're, if you're blind or colorblind, um, in some degrees, depending on the light levels, you don't see that space in the same way that somebody else does. And so your body is tuned to that to a certain degree, and you perceive that energy, you perceive that architecture. And um, what I find really fascinating about this is that um, I think for a, a lot of times, as architects, we try to figure out what our role is within a kind of a very quickly changing world around us, quite literally the environment, the research, um, the technologies, and the fact that architecture and I say architecture, but I'm really saying is landscape architecture, architecture, the design of space, um, is in a really unique place because that's what we do best, right? We, we borrow from other disciplines, we reintegrate, and we play out the scenarios of what they can be and how we can hone them. And a rather important thing here is that this is not a utopic, this is not a dystopic, this is a very messy period of time in which much, much like cell phone reception, right? So if you're on the subway, you're, you're in the subway going from point A to point B, and you have no reception, but somehow some guy five seats down is still talking on the phone. Your first question is, what cell provider do they have that I don't, that he's still getting reception and I don't? The second side of that is, that person has access to information that you don't. And so that person has connected to an, a series of information and variables that you don't have access to. And if you extrapolate that further, when you start thinking about social economic issues, access to public space, our public space around us is very well potentially going in the direction of that it's not accessible to all people equally. And we like to think of as ADA, um, sort of um, accessibility laws as one of the last hurdles to sort of get people to all be in the same space equally. But in truth, two people could very well be geographically right next to each other but not actually share the same space because they perceive different data, they perceive different information. Um, and that has a lot to do with your healthcare, that has a lot to do with your ability to purchase technology, that has, your, that has uh, to do with your ability to get to certain locations. And so public space is at a really kind of crucial point in terms of trying to understand what the scenarios and implications are of that. And I'm just kind of throwing this in here as a, a kind of an example in which when we do think about um, Architecture, this is just sort of tongue-in-cheek, but the stacked duck or the stuffed pig. Um, we, we, for, uh, we almost want to think of architecture as these two extremes, right, where either, either you, you think of geometry and you think of program, where you get these series of program boxes, think of them as foam or, or computer model programs of entry, dimensions for theater, dimensions for uh, office, and we kind of congregate them together, and we get this kind of pixelated stack duck, right? You can all think about that as to who would fall within those categories. Or this idea of a continually smooth surface that, like a butcher, then just gets kind of chopped, chopped up into various programs. Um, but as extreme as these two are within architecture and sit on very different worlds as to software typologies versus kind of cutting up programs, this idea of very strict, tight program boxes that get aggregated. Um, these really are really within one camp, which is essentially programs and methods of design that use surface as a means for their primary mechanism of controlling space. And so when we think about this professionally, it, it becomes intriguing because what you don't want to have happen is energy to become yet another subset of a growing subset of specialties. Um, and if you think about lead right now, um, you could think of energy as just yet another uh, specification within a very long line of requirements professionally that are required because buildings, quite frankly, are so complicated today. Um, but if you, if, so if you go back to the 15th century, and I know this slide might be a little dark, um, you have this idea of an architect. So um, it was like Brunelleschi, if you're thinking about the Duomo in Florence, the idea of an individual as a model maker, painter, um, engineer, architect, inventor to make the pulley systems. You know, it, things were, I mean, there's for a lot of reasons, but 
the architect was seen as a kind of a mixed hat of, of, of activities and, and specialties. Um, in the 18th century, this is, you know, this is tied a lot to the idea of, of, uh, of iron and eventually steel, where um, that was a material that kind of made its way more into engineering than it did in architecture initially. But you got a split both in the education and in the profession of architecture and engineering. And what you're looking at here on the right-hand side are a list of professional um, uh, organizations and the dates in which they became um, licensed, essentially professional. So the idea of architecture as an American Institute of Architects was um, formed in 1857, landscape architects, uh, 1899, planners, 1978, uh, structural engineers, mechanical, electrical, civil, acoustic. And then below that in the gray are are not professional licensed um, disciplines, but nonetheless, essentially essential for these large projects. Everything from wind studies, the team people who do nothing but team building, graphic consultants, lighting designs, fire protection, traffic. Um, these have become such a huge um, subset of design. And what really becomes, the, what my, I find intriguing about energy as a system is that it transcends more than one profession. Landscape architects they deal with energy, they deal with climate, they deal with microclimates. Architects, again, deal with all these energy systems and the environments that they, that they build within the inside. And if you take, you know, this, would, this one example being um, Coop Himmenblau's uh, BMW, you know, you look at this and you realize here on the left-hand side are all the people that worked on that project within Coop Himmenblau. And on the right-hand side, you know, these are the credits of all the consultants, everything from, from structural engineering, mechanical, the stage consultants, photovoltaics, kitchen technologies, landscape. I mean, this is not unique to this project. It just goes to show the kind of complexity that's required. But it's also the opportunity, potentially, to think of energy would not to just become another consultant system, but actually become a way of actually thinking of a kind of larger objectives of what the profession can be, what it can do for design. And quite frankly, when you start thinking of energy not simply as a fuel, but if we can give it shape, if we can give it aesthetic qualities, and we can give an image to it, we can actually use it as a way of bringing it to the forefront of discussion within politics within the um, um, commerce, uh, something that people actually strive for, something that actually gives it a public image to be a debate that isn't simply a power unit of a Tesla model car or, or an efficiency modeling system, but instead as an actual commodity that people could covet and want, and in a sense, require people to get behind and back in new ways in order to continue to pressure and explore and develop it further. Um, and so looking at, just want to look at a, a couple of examples from um, from the office, uh, which range from in the past from you know larger scale competition entries to smaller um, prototypes and design installations as a way of testing some of these ideas, and so this is this is an image uh, that's not from Weathers um, of uh, from CERN um, in uh, Switzerland and France, and what's really when it was kind of I'm showing this because it's an, it's an interesting moment where this is an example of excess of energy in pursuit of knowledge, you know, in the pursuit of knowing, knowing something no, more about the universe around us, right? So CERN, this is, if you look at the bottom here, CERN uses 1.3 terawatts of hours of electricity annually. That's enough to fuel 300,000 homes for a year in the United Kingdom. At a peak consumption, usually around May to mid-December, CERN uses about 200 megawatts of power. Uh, <laughs> which is about one third the amount of energy to feed the, the nearby city of Geneva. And so this is excess energy. But the idea of, of doing this is to hopefully learn something more about the world around us and, and how we got to where we are. And so I'm not trying to make the segue that, you know, that this is what Weathers is doing in any way. But the idea is that when we start thinking about energy, we, it's, I think it's debilitating if we always think about it under the rubric about how sufficient, um, sustainable it is how energy efficient the project is. Because quite frankly, if we look back to steel, concrete, glass, those were not very efficient endeavors in the beginning. They're extremely expensive, um, but they had their place. And in time, things caught up to them, and they were actually be used in, in other ways and advanced. And so if we start thinking of energy as a material, you know, it's important sometimes to expend a little bit more to learn more from it and what we can do with it to then use it as something that could become a mechanism for, for future work. And so um, what I'm looking at here is this is a project for 
a kind of just a speculative idea of looking at how we could create a space outdoors um, that was open for the public park, open for the public systems, um, used energy as a kind of microclimate design, but could also dissipate and just and go away when, when it wasn't needed. And so this idea is, and I'll come back to this diagram in a minute, which is um, an Odom diagram. So this is, um, Odom was an individual um, in the late 60s and 70s who was developing these diagram systems of information where you could look at anything from, say, something as small as this project here to something as big as a city. And you could diagram out information, energy, data, um, as it moved in and out of a system. You know, so you could understand the makings of a system and how that system worked and the kind of pluses and minuses of that, of that transfer. Um, and so in these examples, these were, these were photographs of a, of a kind of stage model in which you had these base plates of a, you know, so we start thinking about public parks. This, this is a huge, actually, subset of the, the work that Weathers does, is looking at park systems and open spaces within cities. So if, if right now, roughly half the world's population lives in a city, and of course, that definition of city is, is you know, can be, can be, you know, can be pretty loose. Um, but nonetheless, I think the, the idea is that within the next 25 years, three quarters of the world's population will be in a city. And so public parks have always been a very important subset of the city as a place of, of recreation, of, of, of um, socialization. It's a place in which um, as these cities become more and more dense and more and more people, our public parks are going to actually have more and more uh, pressure upon them um, to accommodate. And there's that old saying that in Central Park um, about no new buildings in Central Park, which, of course, isn't true. They can continually find ways of making new buildings in Central Park. But the idea is that um, when you start thinking about energy, is it possible to still build spaces that can be used and accommodated, but at the same time go away when they're not ne needed? So when people think about energy and the use of energy and the creation of, like, say, microclimates outdoors, one of the big uh, questions that come up is, well, through entropy and this idea of energy dispersing, isn't that a huge liability? Why would, you, why would you do that when it would just go away or could go away? And that's actually possibly a huge benefit of it. So like street lighting is when you don't need a street light or you don't need a light, you can turn it off, right? Half of something like 80% of, of a street light is, is just light. The other 15 10% is really just the infrastructure behind it. And so it gives you the possibility of having a very um, – flexible system in play that can come and go when it's not needed. So these are our base plates that are kind of set in space, and these become these kind of second suns that are essentially drone-like, that can actually move in and out of space. They can actually be tuned to a space, and then working with the energy systems between these two, create a microclimate. And so what you're looking at are a series of people in one of these spaces with another individual who potentially is not being able to access it or can't perceive that energy change. Um, and what we're looking at here then are just different examples of, of down, trying to downplay a little bit more of the geometry and trying to figure out more about how um, those spaces um, work. And so you can see a little bit here, you have a series of people within a space tuned to that energy system. And as somebody moves into that space, um, that, that, that space itself grows or changes. So you can see it as a discrete object here, one small space, maybe another smaller space behind it. And in the right-hand corner, you start realizing that as you start building these together, they actually start to create larger microclimates, a little bit like that first photograph I showed of street lighting, individual lights on a street shot from space become much larger and much more massive. And so these are, these are the photos. These are from... Um, from the Istanbul uh, Design Biennial uh, last year. And these are just a couple of the shots just to show them as um, the, the kind of models that they were uh, before they were photographed. And so what I was getting at with this um, is the importance of understanding shape. So when you think about shape within energy, it's really um, a back and forth between what you have here in black are the sources of energy, so whether they're electromagnetic field, whether they're um, uh, thermal conditions, whether they're light, different spectrums of light. Um, 
And then we have on in the white are the environment itself. So you have solar radiation, humidity, temperature, air velocity. And the shape of an energy or the shape of energy itself as a microclimate is really the negotiation between these energies being produced and the environment around it that's pushing against it. So again, going back to the street lighting would be even if a street light was set up and it was the same amount of power coming out and given to it, same amount of lumens being produced, um, that same light would look very different on a new moon than a full moon, right? So when the moon is out and it's full, a lot of excess light, that boundary would probably be blurry and a little bit larger than it would be otherwise. And a new moon, it's less light, less light bouncing back off of the moon, and that, that edge is very tight. It, the, the street light hasn't changed. The environment around it has changed, and therefore the boundary of that street light looks different. It's a, little, it's a lot like um, a campfire, right? Cold night, throw on some logs, you get a fire, you get an edge. If it gets much colder, that edge gets shrunk. So you either have to put more fuel on to build that fire, or um, the edge itself has just sort of gotten smaller. And so what we're looking at here is just through the course of a day or an hour, a week, 15 minutes, is you could very well get a change in the climate around it affecting how that shape of the environment or that, that architecture changes. And so just to, to give you an example of that, if we're looking at a, a kind of, say, a, a graph here, and E is energy and X is the environment, the relationship between each other as they come in contact produces a space. Um, if E stays the same, same amount of energy being outputted, but the environmental climate increases, then the E is going to get smaller, right? There's more pressure on it. But it doesn't mean that that space, whether it's E electromagnetic, E sound, E thermal plus electromagnetic, you know, you can actually change those variables and regain that boundary. It's just that the, 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 the aesthetics will change, right? So just like a campfire, you get a series of light, the color of that fire, you throw a whole lot more fuel on there, it, gets, it burns brighter, the color of that fire changes. And so there's actually a back and forth between the, the materials being given off and the actual aesthetics of the shape. And in a weird way, it actually starts to produce a kind of vernacular. So if you get a, um, a kind of spec order house, and you decide to build it in Boston and in Guadalajara, uh, you could very well get something that looks exactly the same, right? Same paint colors, same boundaries of rooms, um, same dimensions of rooms. Um, you may have to change some of the weatherproofing systems, but for essentially you get the same architecture in one place and the other. Um, but when you start thinking about energy microclimates, you actually get a vernacular because that same place in Boston, that same system in Boston and that same system in Guadalajara will actually behave very differently based on the climatic uh, site that it's actually positioned in. And so I'm just going to uh, show a couple of quick examples. Um, these, these were, this was a project that uh, we had done in, um, in Los Angeles at the Max Center. It, it was just a project in which uh, various offices got different spaces within the building and we're trying to tune to them. And so what we wound up doing was creating these six uh, identical shapes in terms of geometry, um, running a series of simulations, um, computational fluid, just to understand heating systems and air velocity, because each one of these has not only um, a heating system within the water to create condensation and heat, uh, it had a fan that actually moved air around. Um, so we had these kind of different variables within each one, and set them differently so that we actually got different behaviors. So this one we're looking at here is actually the control where there was nothing in it. So based on the time of day, the temperature, that would actually um, ebb and flow in terms of uh, condensation and temperature, while others actually had um, different variables kind of in play. So even though they all looked identical, they would actually behave differently. And so what you're looking at here is uh, the interior of one of these acrylic shapes that we had milled and etched so that we could actually hopefully trap some of that, that condensation that we were trying to move around. Uh, this is a project that's actually come back now. Um, this is for a competition uh, that we were shortlisted for in San, um, San Fernando uh, Corridor Temporary Art Project. And what we were looking at was um, shag carpet. And so we, we you know, we, we look at taking sort of AstroTurf as an early example, and it's a really kind of a great story with AstroTurf as 
that's something that kind of started down in the Astrodome down in Houston, Texas, as a, an artificial uh, climate where the Astrodome had this, um, they kind of refer to it as the eighth wonder of the world, this giant project that was so large, had glass roof system, grass on the bottom. The project was so big, it had quite literally started creating its own microclimates where it would actually rain inside the Astrodome because um, the heat and the coolness of the two different zones would actually start to create a, a convection cycle. And so they wound up blacking out the top of the Astrodome, which no light could grow in, so all the grass died, so they developed this idea of AstroTurf. What we wound up doing was just kind of taking this, this AstroTurf for this throw rug and advancing it even further, so we were working with heating systems, lighting systems, and sound as a kind of outdoor throw rug that you could go to and lay on and actually create these little outdoor microclimates that the body could be in and absorb it as an outdoor space, regardless of the, the climate itself. Um, and so looking at here is just that, that same logic, but doing it at a much larger scale. This is a project for in Reykjavik, Iceland, in which they are trying to redevelop part of Reykjavik to the south, taking over an old U.S. air uh, field, and that create these series of, uh, uh, I think, a university, um, a commercial center, housing, public recreation. And we did a series of, of, of moves where we created a kind of outer perimeter of parking garages for circulation mounted on top of those parking garages and then worked with basically the, the geothermal that exists within Iceland. Something like 99% of all the homes in Iceland are heated by geothermal. And there was this pond at the bottom of the site that was brackish where they would actually dump in some of the excess energy system that they were from the plants and it actually warm the water. And so we were thinking of why not we actually use that as a wash. And so we actually pump the idea being the pump excess or use the geothermal to actually warm the soil within this lower zone as a wash that could actually produce um, and harvest and work with different vegetation, different climates for all your recreation in this lower area. And of course that would then rise and grow depending on the course of the time of the year. So, um, just to kind of conclude here, this, this relationship of both the human body and the material is what I was kind of referring to. They didn't talk too much about it, this idea of the touching or this kind of swerve, is that a couple of things happen here that are, that are kind of really unique opportunities, I feel. Uh, one is that space essentially allows it to become uh, malleable and tunable. So much like street lighting or other outdoor microclimates, these forms of energy can be quickly manipulated to be turned on um, or off, made stronger, weaker. Flexibility for creating and removing material presence is a unique quality of the architecture. It's updatable. So when such a large percentage of architecture shape comes from the energy released, it's the small technological devices, essentially the light bulb in the architectural system that can be easily updated as technology advances, energies manipulation and efficiencies increase. So instead of actually thinking about having to update an entire architectural mass as things become outdated or your needs change, you could actually, like going from incandescent light bulb to an LED light bulb. The socket is still the same, the power wattage decreases, but the, um, the experience and the qualities uh, uh, don't. And this is not unlike going back to that Tesla example where as that those Tesla cars, which are so intriguing, is that much of those updates are software updates. So as they go from, from cars as we recognize them to cars that are, say, self-driving, that's essentially a, a software update that, goes, that gets pushed through the cars. And so you can actually see these as um, essentially updatable materials. Um, evolving social experience. So much like two individuals might today have different access to internet reception based on separate cell providers and equipment, individual access and ability to perceive sensory information will vary along social economic status, uh, technological demographics, health, making some the same public space unique among multiple user groups. Ethical and moral dilemma. So ethical and moral issues inevitably arise when the willful manipulation of a global climate and the human physiology is certain. It's through these first spatial scenarios that potential outcomes can be most completely explored. And so the other role that I find intriguing here with architecture is that because so many things are moving so quickly within, physio within uh, bioengineering and wearables and within the energy fields is that 
it almost requires, I think the architecture has a, has a great opportunity to play a role here to actually steer those industries a little bit or be able to find, produce some feedback to them because they don't really communicate with each other. Oddly enough, energy and bioengineering, it's really only the architectural world that sees the kind of shared platform, which is a, a changing of space, the ability to perceive that space that brings those two together. And so architects can play, actually play a role in um, being able to guide and inform some of these things that, are, quite frankly, I don't think are being thought about. And new conservations about environmental, uh, conversations about environmental change. So this work seeks to give energy a public face that excites and inspires a progressive discussion about our inevitable changing environment and the role that architecture can play. So I'll leave it at that. John again. Um, there is a panel in uh, 206 right now being hosted by Contestant Journal. Please look out for an interview with Sean on this year's issue of Contestant Journal. That will be held and interview in the next couple of weeks, so look out for that. Um, thanks again, Sean, and uh, thanks for coming. Today. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, have a great time. Good luck with everything this week. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Take care. Have a good one.